so good evening everybody and uh, especially good morning to john while we are here uh, catching up back from getting back from office catching up home john is very uh, it's a very early day for you john thanks for uh, joining today before i formally uh, welcome you as as uh, you all know this hrfi hr federation of india is an association of people of more than 14000 plus mainly a whatsapp group and in linkedin 10000 plus we have a very strict uh, code of conduct being followed it's a no funds organization and uh, adherence to code of conduct have seen very recently also three of the managing committee members moving out however and uh, we are thankful to certain organizations who help us do these sorts of activities of organizing webinars seminars on our behalf uh, so this is the 29th one which is happening during this lockdown period which is co-powered by smartem spaces so i would request rao sahib uh, just to play a short video about smartem spaces so that participants know that uh, which is the organization behind us helping uh, this happen rao sahib sir meji a kashyap oh hello rao sahib good yeah kashyap you can play the video yeah um i'm unable to share my screen no no uh um, i'm unable to share my screen actually oh one second wait wait so how do we do it we skip yeah, it this time yeah, no once i will do that okay can you see yeah yeah Yes, so thank thank you, Mr. Kashyap. So, uh, Smartem Spaces is actually into providing solutions, which is the need of the art today for our workplaces. Thank you, Smartem, for being a part of uh, this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, formally, I again uh, welcome John once again. Really fortunate to have you, John. Uh, you. Speakers like you all uh, have really now provide us. not only that impetus also that opportunity for hrfi to have hosted people like you all who are actually the who and who of the world today 
as far as leadership hr coaching and all those things are concerned and uh, thank you pooja also good evening to you a very late evening for you i understand again for uh, being with us today and help moderate the session the topic will be uh, more so a discussion between uh, uh, pooja and uh, views of john coming up in the area of intelligent leadership compass while might be as, as i know all the participants have already gone through john's profile but i take the honor of formally introducing you all uh, john to you all he is the leading ceo and professional coach around the world has been selected as the world's number one coaching authority for the second consecutive year by global gurus this year again uh, this year as a best selling author and globally renowned coach speaker and educator while inclusion in the global guru top 30 global coaches is an honor in itself uh, really congratulations to you john being distinguished as the world's best professional coach is a very special honor and really we are fortunate to have you here this selection is based on professional accomplishments contributions to the field of coaching leadership research pr respect and pioneering thought leadership john is the creator of the unique powerful and game changing intelligent leadership il which is famously known as executive coaching philosophy and process since 2012 he has used his proprietary coaching methodology methodology with more than 50 global ceos top government leaders and professional athletes to help them become stronger more effective and vibrant leaders in their professional and personal lives he has served as the executive coach to the late steve jobs as well as the former legendary ceo of pepsico roger enrico he and his company john mayton global incorporates are the owners of new numerous registered trademarks awarded by the united states patent and trademark office including john mayton john mayton intelligent leadership certified executive coach intelligent leadership intelligent leadership certified executive coaching etc etc the lead uh, the list goes on strategic tactical leadership index 360 the five cultures of culture assessment culture cultural transformation readiness assessment 40 i i think we will get to know certain glimpses of all of this today john we would definitely look forward to he is also the creator of john mayton university jmu which offers the unique and game changing intelligent leadership executive coaching blueprint for success accredited by the international coach federation since 2017 he has personally mentored over 450 global executive coaches from 52 countries 450 i think the number has grown this is most probably a dated number uh, it has definitely grown uh, from 52 countries in the proprietary il philosophy process and tools jmu also offers two and half day intelligent leadership retreat c level aspire elite mastermind the intelligent leader four day mastermind immersion and a series of award winning virtual and online leadership development programs wow these programs include the 50 laws of intelligent leadership online academy uh, john while this intelligent leadership has been off and on going on coming while i am reading it would like to know much more of an insight what's behind naming it so uh, however yes. after 15 years working in the uh, corporate workforce he relaunched his business in 2010 with a mission to help leaders future leaders and organizations break through to become the best they can be the greatest testimony to his uh, core purpose which made him realize his dream is his many philanthropic endeavors which include creating an endowed scholarship fund in his name at the university of central florida 
uh, where he himself graduated from in 1980 as first in his class with an MS in Industrial Organizational Psychology, and which led him to the creation of the John Mitchell Leadership and Coaching Scholarship. He is author of nine books, including best, uh, four bestsellers, uh, Talent Leadership, Intelligent Leadership, Cultural Transformation, and The Intelligent Leader, October 2019, etc., cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. So uh, a big, big applause and really honored to have you, John. Wonderful Thank to you. know you and uh, you. really interacting, uh, getting an opportunity for many of us around 450 already logged in to have interaction with you. Puja, I think you are now a uh, home name for HRFI. <laughs> I, I, I'll still formally briefly tell about you. Uh, she is into personal leadership coach. She is again mentored by John. Yes. That uh, is very important in my brief because <laughs> I take a lot of pride in that. Yes. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. That always goes with my brief. Yeah. She is founder of Leadership Demystify uh, webinars and co-founder of Rewire. Her coaches are entrepreneurs, young leaders, professionals, educators, parents, women, and Gen Z. She is on mission to create communities of inspiring, courageous, and authentic leaders across age span and geographies. Puja was being or has been organized for working on Millennium Space. She has been recently awarded Sculptors and Fifth. One influential woman award. Uh, so that's what. Over to you, Puja and John. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank so you so much. So honored. So today's session is a very, very special session because it's going to be conversation with my guru. <laughs> so a person whom um, is, uh, who has mentored me, and uh, while Sumit has beautifully, uh, you know, said, uh, read out his bio and there's so much to win into it i'm going to just highlight a couple of things uh one is john every day he cycle whenever he's in town he would cycle i think around 80 to 100 miles yeah is it yes that's what yep. he cycles and out of so many roles what he plays the one role which is very proud of is his adopted grandfather to four grandchildren and that is something he's very very proud of and this is the one who inspires so many people around and he drives inspiration from a beautiful lady, his childhood sweetheart girl. And uh, besides this, uh, Nick Maton, who is my dear friend as well, and this is John's son, we are, part we are partners in a millennial space. So how is going to be today's session? Um, today's session is going to be structured into um, four things we are going to cover on personal leadership leadership with respect to the organization and then a little bit on coaching and the current uh, pandemic situation how do we uh, raise the bar of our leadership on this note a very very warm welcome i am so so honored and it's always a learning uh, whenever i interact with you joy <laughs> Pooja, thank you so, so much. And Summit, thank you very, very much. Thank you, HRFI. Uh, thank you so much. I hope everybody is uh, staying safe uh, with, with themselves and their families. And Pooja, what a great honor it is to be with you today. <laughs> so, John, um, while there is so much which is read about you, but I would want to know, and I know on the conversations we have discussed this, but for the larger forum, how did you got on the path of coaching? Uh, what was those turning points in life which really got you on? So could you just give us please a peek on your journey now? Yes, I would love to, Pooja. So I actually got a really late start on coaching. Um, I had my own business um, that I launched at around age 29. And I did that for about 10 years, but there was no coaching. It was all speaking. And so I traveled extensively, raised the family. Uh, and um, after about seven or eight years, um, it was not working. And so to make a long story short, uh, I went back into the corporate world. 
And I did that for 15 years. So from age 40 to 55, I worked for a number of uh, large consultancies, uh, primarily within the, within the human resource space. Um, there was a particular organization that no longer exists by the name of Drake Bean Warren. Uh, it was also known as DBM. DBM was a large outplacement company, Hoosier. Uh, back then. I think they ended up merging with uh, Wright Management or Lee Hecht. I can't recall. But I was head of sales, business development, and I had 50 salespeople on my team. And all of a sudden, I felt a, a knack for coaching. Um, I would have people on my team saying, you've got a, a strong ability to uh, unlock and unleash and, 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 and coach and mentor. And, and so that was, I, I think my first orientation to that maybe coaching would be my calling, you know, and it, and it took me, uh, it took me until about age 54, uh, about 10 years ago when I, you know, I literally had a calling to, to do this amazing work that we're called to do. But wow. that's what happened. It's at the age of 54, and now when you see the 10 years, it's, it's a tremendous work, right? And I think when you said all the things, the one thing which kept on striking me is, John, that it's so much about your personal leadership, and even you speak a lot about inner core. So even before a person graduates or goes into an organization where an organization is investing, but what an individual can do to, at an individual level to ignite that personal leadership within them? We're not going to survive Pooja as, as people, uh, and, that, and that sounds pretty drastic, but obviously look at the pandemic uh, as a, a strong uh, measure of how difficult life is. Um, th there's, no, there's no straight line for any of us. And yes, we're going we're gonna to fight through this pandemic and we are going to be successful. But lo and behold, in three to four years or five years or seven years, there will be another major disruptor. And so is the essence of life, right? So what I've learned, and it took me a long time to learn it, is that we've got to be very, very strong and vibrant, mature on the inside. Our soul, our inner core absolutely determines everything. And I, I've, I've dedicated my, my last 10 years, as you know, to helping leaders and future leaders get much stronger on their inner core. And that includes things like having a balanced self-image. Uh, don't, don't, don't have a massive ego. It's, it's okay to believe in yourself. Uh, it's important to have incredible character. It's important to emphasize the right values as we go forward every single day. You've got to be a positive thinker. You've got to have balanced emotions. You've got to be altruistic. Uh, and, and what I've learned is if you're really strong, mature, and vibrant in the inner, inner core, beautiful things will spill to the outer core. And that's what the world sees and experiences from each and every one of us. Um, so it doesn't happen magically. And I believe all of us, everybody listening in, the HR directors, the HR leaders, you're, you're being called, all of you, all of us, to raise the bar on the individuals within your organizations to make sure that their inner, that all of their inner cores and your inner core is strong, mature, and vibrant. Because if that's strong, I believe that we can, uh, I believe that we can, we can overcome any, any disruption that comes our way. Yes, and that's so powerful, John, because most of the times we are focuses completely on the outer core. And it's very few that would really do that inner core work. And that's what you do it, that you drive from inner core to outer core. And we, I mean, most of the time, I think we're just stuck in the outer core. So, uh, John, while you spoke about the organization, and especially in the organization, when they're moving people up the ladder, the first thing is to pick up the people who are high performer or uh, people who have been performing repeatedly very well. So I call them like those people with the producer mindset when they come in the, uh, when they have been elevated, right? So right. they need to make that mind shift from just being the producer mindset, just been focusing on tasks or on uh, sales to now being leading a team. And that's where the gap happens. So right. any tips there, uh, John, uh, for the organization 
as well as for the uh, for the young managers who have been moved um, who have to make that shift yeah there's no question Pooja there is an algorithm that's very interesting and the algorithm is that uh, thinking patterns will absolutely predict emotions emotions will predict behavior and ultimately behavior predicts results and there are so many executives that I work with who that when you actually coach and you work through that algorithm with them, you know this, that what, what ends up happening is they realize, my goodness, the results that I get in my personal, my professional life and our team is truly a function of how powerful and strong and vibrant our thinking patterns are. If we make good decisions, lo and behold, we're gonna drive great results. So there's no question that algorithm exists. And I think, you know, the organizations listening in here today, you know, as we begin to move people, the, the high potentials, the emerging leaders who have so much potential to move the world in a positive direction, the talent in the young people is incredible. We've got an obligation to accelerate the development of the younger talent in the world. And I, I believe we've got to ignite uh, in, uh, in leaders and future leaders better questions. Better questions need to be asked, Pooja. Mm -hmm. and, and it starts with uh, helping emerging leaders and future leaders and high potentials ask the really big questions. Uh, what's the vision of the essence of the person and leader? Not so much that I want to become, but even more importantly, and even bigger, right, is what I must become. Because mm -hmm. must become is a higher level responsibility and accountability. Most people don't think like that. And if you want in your organization innovation and, you, and, you, and you're trying to equip your leaders and future leaders with the skills they need to navigate complexity, they're not gonna survive and they're not gonna be successful unless they're thinking really, really big. So asking really good questions is vitally important. I think also another question that we want future leaders to think about is, do you, are you vulnerable enough to ask yourself um, uh, to go to people and, and ask them for feedback? Uh, to, to me, that's the instigator to growth. Uh, that's the instigator to becoming the best that we can be is being open to feedback. It's one of the things that held me back for 55 years. I finally realized, Pooja, as you know, that the reason I wasn't truly breaking through and not truly becoming the best that I could be, uh, that I, was, I, I thought I had all the answers and I didn't have many answers at all. And so I believe what is gonna ignite the acceleration of incredible talent is getting them to ask really good questions. Be open to feedback, get your 360s going. Uh, feedback is, we have a choice with feedback. We can accept it or reject it. But if you reject it, it's not going to it's not going to serve you very well. Um, and I think I, I think also getting future leaders to uh, be very very clear about what their gifts and strengths are. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't know what their gifts and strengths are, and if we can help leaders and future leaders really get very clear about what their gifts are and be very proud of those gifts and strengths, uh, to embrace those gifts and strengths, and to commit to making those strengths even stronger tomorrow than they are today. Those are things that I think all the HR leaders listening in are some of the things that can do, they can do to ignite the right mindset, right? Which will yield the right emotions, which will yield the right behavior, which will yield the results that we're all looking for. I hope that helps. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes, it does. And I think it, it beautifully relates to what you keep on saying, right? It's can, will, and must. Uh, that three things, right? That Absolutely. ultimately you need to get onto the connectedness culture, which is so, so important. And that would come through the through when we ask the right questions. And I think that vulnerability as well. Yeah, it's, it beautifully answers. Now, John, uh, sometimes, you know, especially in the organization, we all know that uh, right leadership is important for a talent and a culture. 
but we don't have choice who our bosses are, who our managers are, right? So how can one uh, succeed under a leadership which is not so conducive? Any tips there? <laughs> well, we've got certainly, uh, and those, those are listening in, listen, you know, you're doing great work. Um, and all of you are committed to this worthy purpose, uh, this major cause of closing the leadership gap. We, we all have a responsibility. It's the thing that motivates me every single day when I get up is I see the leadership gap. I think we all do. Uh, and we've got a responsibility to close it. So if you're stuck in a position where you're reporting to somebody who's not a great leader, you've got to put a premium on your self-leadership. And there is a higher calling. And it's been my experience that, you know, if you can go deep into your inner core and discover, and this is not easy, Pooja, but it's worthy work. You've got to discover why you're on the earth. Most people do not ask themselves those incredibly difficult questions. But once we understand why we're on the earth and we've established clarity as to uh, our purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Our purpose, our calling, even our legacy in many respects, that work is very important because when you're stuck with a leader who's not very good, you've got to hold on to strength. And those leaders and those people who have done that work establish a great deal of strength and resilience to be able to combat that because it's just a matter of time, right? And it's also a function of it's going to ignite them to start to pursue their calling. And I think that's important. I think the other thing too is that, you know, stay very strong to your character. You know, if your character is really strong uh, and you don't deviate from great character, which obviously is a deep inner core soul element, there is no stopping you in your life. And when you think about your character, I want everybody to think about this. It's made up of being courageous and courageous can be exhibited a lot of different ways. It could be exhibited by you having the courage to look inside and accept that you're really good, but you got things to improve on. Courage could also be exhibited by you having the ability to provide feedback back to somebody who's driving you crazy. For example, if you don't have a leader who's not giving you opportunities, you've got to be assertive and so on and so forth. I also believe hard work pays off and you may not get the results immediately, but if you stay very core to being diligent and working very, very hard, do your job, good things are gonna happen because people are gonna notice. Maybe your direct manager's not gonna notice, but somebody's gonna look around and say, did you see Pooja? Did you see Pooja? Pooja's, Pooja's incredible. So and, and what ends up happening, Pooja, everybody gets distracted, right? The key is to do your job, work hard, right? I think the third thing is to be very, to show gratitude to others, to go up to people and say, thank you very much. There's no way we can be successful without others. So show your heart, uh, be honest with people, be loyal, be modest. Those are the elements in my experience. If you stay close to those things in the end, in the end, uh, you're going to find a situation, you're going to find a position, you're going to find a leader that you need to be with who's going to accelerate your development. So you are, that's I hope that beautifully helps. answered, John, beautifully. I mean, rather than diverting and putting all your energy to something which is outside your control, it's better to focus on, especially when you have your core focus design, the entire energy and the way one would become action oriented would completely change and would create that executive presence as well somewhere so that the other people notice you. Yeah, that, that's that's lovely. I mean, yeah, so that's we do speak about a good leadership and there is a way now. Even in a not so conducive leadership, one can walk through. Just you got to fight it. You got to fight. You got to, you just got to fight because, you know, you talked about presence. 
you know, your presence is a function of what you say. It's a function of what you look like when you say it. And it's also um, how you say it. It's what you say, how you say it, what you look like when you say it. And you could be, you could be having a very, very tough day. Um, but you've got to, you've got to have that strong mindset that you're going to, you, because ultimately whatever presence that you've got is going to establish your reputation. And we've got to make sure every single day that our presence is really, really strong. You could be having a really tough day. Maybe the kids, maybe the kids haven't slept all night, right? Mm -hmm. And you're tired, but people rely on you. You know, you got to show up and you got to deliver the goods. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter. And if you stick to that and build a habit, people were going to notice. And, you know, um, and, and guess what? You, you might get noticed in a meeting by another leader, and, and that leader's going to approach you, and you might get a new opportunity. Wow, that's beautiful. So while we've been talking about leader and leadership, so uh, I have experienced, John, um, you know, when I coach uh, entrepreneurs, few of successful startups, they have leaders, especially who have a very strong personality. Right. So I have a question. Leaders with such strong personality, is it a good leadership style? And second is, because we talk so much about uh, getting them to that inflection point wherein the change happens, right? The self-awareness. How can one really get such a leader who's, um, who's very strong, you know, to, to the self-awareness point? And you uh, I know you have in our conversation mentioned about Steve Jobs and your, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your response here, John. There, it's a, to, it, and Steve Jobs is one example. Uh, since then, I, I've had the, the privilege of working with many, many, many top executives, uh, many top CEOs, some government leaders. And the commonality that I see around exactly what you're talking about uh, is incredible. Uh, I, I believe that um, a maniacal, maniacal drive for results is absolutely a predictor of success. Mm -hmm. I have never seen a successful executive who's not driven for results. It's just a matter of how they present it and how they show it. Most executives, <clears throat> and I believe this is true for all of us, Pooja, in our lives, whatever your pursuit is, it is non-negotiable, non-negotiable that you drive towards your vision. What is the vision of the essence of the personal leader you must become? Non-negotiable, right? Mm -hmm. And when you look at the Jeff Bezos of the world, right, and there's numerous other examples Tiger, how about Tiger from GenPact is a great example, right? I know Tiger very, very well. I had the opportunity to actually do a little bit of work with Tiger in 2016. He's a legend. He is a driven human being, driven, right? So here's the thing. I believe great leadership, yes, I believe the drive for results, the maniacal passion to make a difference, is a necessary but not sufficient condition to becoming a great leader. I believe that you've got to optimize your heart and I believe you've got to optimize your soul and you've got to optimize your instincts. And there are very, very few leaders that I've ever worked with who have actually optimized all of those elements. Interesting, right? And it tells us that despite all the success that we see in so many people, there's still so much room for improvement. And it doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't matter what role that you're in, and it doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have, and the cars that you've got don't have, and houses, it's all irrelevant. We are all on a journey. And those human beings who wake up every day, and they commit to creating more abundance in the world, however that's defined, 
those are the ingredients in my mind to being successful. The, the entrepreneurs uh, who, who might be listening in, go after it, go after it with passion. Just make sure that you've got your heart, you care about people, you're altruistic, and you're all about providing abundance to the world. And, and there will be no stopping, no stopping you. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to that self-awareness? Because sometimes uh, these leaders would, they are very result focused, right? And especially if something is working for long, they wouldn't want to, you know, that <clears throat> driving them or, you know, that inflection point where the change begins in. How do we manage that, John? It's very hard. They're, you know, listen, uh, are, are they coachable, right? And that comes back to the vulnerability, Pooja. Um, the entrepreneurs out there who are not vulnerable, who believe that they've got all the answers, who believe that their success is tied to the product or service, you're absolutely mistaken. Period. End of story. If you look at the research done by McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, they are very clear in the research. The entrepreneurs who are most successful are absolutely driven human beings, but they also, they know that leadership and culture are just as strong predictors and in sometimes even stronger predictors than how great their product or service is. So it's been my experience that when an entrepreneur calls me in, to work with them, we, we talk about, are they open to doing a 360 degree survey? And a lot of them say, what is that, right? Yeah, Some, especially for the peer, especially for yeah, the peer, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, so uh, if, if they're not open to getting feedback, I excuse myself professionally, I can't work with you, because you're, you're not open. But if you're open, that's the instigator to you become the best of you. So becoming self-aware is critical. And, and it's been my experience. You got to use assessments, Pooja, right? You got to use 360s. You got to do, you know, the assessments that you know, right? Uh, the inner core assessments. And then you, you got to do the interplay. What does all this information say? And then you work with that executive to help them discover some things that they weren't aware of. I think th those are important elements. Beautiful. So we spoke about the assessment and one of the assessment which I personally love and I have been using is obviously Meton Leadership and Ecram Inventory uh, along with the others. So uh, in MLEI, uh, for the sake of the participants here, we have nine traits and it is head, heart and gut. And uh, so John, uh, especially on the helper, right? Uh, one sees that like we don't have a high score on helper usually. So yes. why is it so? <laughs> well, it's interesting, Pooja. Uh, yes, the MLEI has been uh, out since 1996. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, we've got a lot of data. Uh, we, we now have over 12,000 leaders in the database globally. And, and yes, Steve Jobs actually, uh, his, his data is in, in the database and, and many, many other very high profile people. It's very interesting. Uh, so the, the people listening in who don't know the MLEI, the nine traits are what I call igniters. They're engines that reflect the uh, aggregate, if you will, of the inner core, the strength, vibrancy, maturity of the inner core. And the helper trait, what Pooja said, is an igniter of altruism. It, it's an igniter to being courteous and compassionate. And ultimately, the helper trait really is uh, is reflective of, is your heart engaged, you know? And what's interesting is statistically in the database, Pooja, the helper score statistically is the lowest average. It's the lowest mean as compared to the other A traits. So what Pooja is saying is that trait, for some reason, does not seem to ignite as an engine, right? Deep within your soul. And if it doesn't ignite, Obviously, there's not going to be positive spill to the outer core in terms of behavior, right? So why is that? Well, I think there's a variety of reasons. Here's the big one. I just think a lot of leaders, Pooja, are afraid. I, I think it comes down to fear of, of doing these things, fear of maybe coming across a little bit too weak, 
a little too passive uh, and they don't want to come across. So it, they, they withhold all that engine, right? They withhold it. And that's unfortunate. And it's unfortunate because we also measure maturity with all of these traits. And the most mature trait in the database is the helper trait. So what, what does that tell us? It tells us that the trait that ignites courtesy, compassion, altruism, and by the way, HR executives who are listening in, engagement. When you look at engagement, it's a function primarily of your leaders engaging their heart. Interesting, right? But when we look at maturity, it is the most mature trait, meaning that leaders do have the capability to show their heart. We just got to help them see that it's not a weak decision. It's a courageous decision to show your heart. Because ultimately, if you show your heart and your courteous compassion and altruistic to others, guess what? That creates engagement and happiness. Uh, not only, by the way, in our workplaces, but our families. Mm. That's wonderful. You, you, I, it got me. Yeah, I was really thinking because leadership and helper is so important, but always we have, a, and we have been talking about it, John. Uh, John and Emily, and even otherwise, you have always spoken about head, heart, and gut. So yes. I'm wondering, John, that in leadership, a leader needs to demonstrate, uh, because there's no perfect alignment of all three, right? They would be, one who would more, uh, you know, tend towards heart, maybe one would tend towards the uh, uh, head or gut. But according to you, based on your coaching experience, what do you think? What is, uh, what is, the, uh, I wouldn't say it's right, but what is something which would uh, create or strengthen the seeds of greatness and help would help the leader to leave the legacy by head, yeah. heart or gut? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a great question. And what we've what we've done, Pooj, in our research is we've discovered, and obviously we're always doing research. It's just my background, industrial psychology. So I'm very measurement oriented. What we've discovered is that there is no one inner core trait that actually accounts for a disproportionate degree of success in leadership. So you could you could have a predominant high scoring helper trait. Mm -hmm. uh, another and be a great leader. And you could have another leader who's got a predominant perfectionistic trait and, and they would be a great leader. So there's really no big correlation. The biggest correlation, and this is probably not a surprise. I know it's not a surprise to you, but the listeners is that it's really more a function of maturity uh, within the inner core. That's the predictor. And what do I mean by maturity? Well, uh, it, it's not so much thinking about maturity as we think about our kids. You know, when I think about executive maturity, I look at, uh, I'm really talking about, are you agile, Pooja? Uh, are you agile in terms of handling change? That's certainly important these days, right? Mm -hmm. Are you agile in terms of learning? Are you a hungry learner? Do you go after things? Or... Do you wait for people to supply you information? That is a predictor of success, ultimately, and also agility around relationships. So when you think about your executives, uh, HR executives, the ones who are agile, that's mature. And when you look at your high potentials, you should be looking at, are they agile? That's going to be a very, very big predictor of how great a leader they're going to be. Hmm. So being agile, vulnerable, what you have been talking about, as well as how the traits are functioning under stress or are they strong, vibrant, that is something which is going to be determined because even a head, uh, a leader who drives, uh, the primary driver is head, even he can be a great leader. It is how do you manage your emotions and uh, under stress? Is it is it my understanding correct, John? Yeah. It is. And, and, and I use a, a, an example around cholesterol, good and bad cholesterol. You know, each of those engines that reflect our inner core, helper being one of them, they ignite in such a way just like cholesterol. And there's mm -hmm. good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And it's interesting, bad cholesterol will tend to go up under stress. And so it is with the traits that uh, when you're disrupted, uh, when uh, you're under a lot of stress, 
is when there's more probability for bad cholesterol to show up on your, your traits. And the key to greatness as a human being uh, is managing your bad cholesterol on those traits because we don't want that bad cholesterol to emerge into our behavior, right? Yes. I understand it clearly now. I love that example. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it makes it so easy. It breaks down and it's so easy. Uh, John, now during these unprecedented times, uh, organizations have been under huge pressure from all the stakeholders and this pressure somewhere, it gets onto the leaders as well. Right. Now, how can a leader be motivated? Uh, you know, because while dealing with so many pressure around, it can be even, there can be failures as well. So, and in your law 29, I guess you speak about, uh, coming back, you know, how do you uh, turn your failures into success and continue that field? So my question here is um, two questions. One is how does a leader stay motivated when during in this unprecedented times and when there's a humongous pressure around? And uh, maybe the second one, I'll just take it once I hear your response. Okay, it's an excellent question, Pooja. Uh, th this is a challenge. Um, however, let's go back to what we just said. Ultimately, and this is true in our families too, everybody's searching for a degree of uh, certainty, uh, a, a degree of centeredness, uh, a degree of motivation and, and happiness. And really, ultimately, the answer lies in the, in the elevation of your heart. I believe, and this is true, obviously, because we're doing a lot of virtual stuff uh, in organizations. The extent to which you show care, concern, authentically, right? Authentically, concern, care, compassion, courtesy. Those are a lot of C's right there, actually. Um, is and, and being altruistic. Ultimately, when you think about elevating those elements that you can control. We can control these things. We just gotta make a decision to do it, right? The more we do this authentically, something happens. You create centeredness and happiness in others, in your family and at work. As long as it's perceived to be real and authentic, and lo and behold, to me, in this pandemic world that we're in right now, that's going to instigate happiness in you, a degree of certainty in you, centeredness in you, and, and motivation. So I would say to the HR executives, ignite this. This is very, very important uh, in, in the pandemic with all the virtual stuff going on, the leaders who are pushing the lever on these elements are creating engagement, more engagement than others who are not. And that's yielding a higher degree of motivation uh, for the leader themselves. Hmm. So is it somewhere even the privileged mindset in this, which you speak about in your uh, recent book, wherein you covered the seven habits? Uh, seven uh, unlocking yes. secrets. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, John, in that book, you have mentioned um, even about uh, entitlement, entitled mindset versus duty mindset. That's uh, right. Would you please elaborate on that? Uh, well, we're, yes, I, without without question. And I think the example that we just used, Pooja, reflects that. That you know those individuals who wake up every single day and they recognize that uh, there's a duty here. Um, you know, we, we don't want to fall prey to this entitlement mentality, which a lot of people have. They believe that the world owes them things. Uh, and that is absolutely false. Um, the, the people who are truly, truly centered, happy, successful, wake up every single day with the mindset of duty. It's an obligation uh, to, uh, and it's a privilege to wake up every single day 
and have the opportunity, number one, to, to breathe. Uh, number two, to touch the hearts and the minds and the souls of people uh, in their families, uh, in, their, in their organizations, in their communities. Uh, this, this is an obligation. This is why we're on the earth. We're on the earth, not for ourselves, right? And there's a lot of people who run around and they believe that their life is about them. And it's one of the big reasons I believe, and you know this, Pooja, you know my story, when I, when I realized at 54 years old, my life was not about me, it was about this duty, duty to touch hearts, minds, and souls and make a difference in the world. When I actually understood that and I embraced it and I internalized it, my life took off. Not only my family, but, but, but my, 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 the last 10 years, people ask me, how have you done what you've done? You know this, right? How have you become number one executive coach in the world? All said with incredible humility, right? And I pinch myself. I pinch myself every single day. But I know one thing that uh, I take it, I, I don't take it for granted. I, I know why I'm on the earth. I'm on the earth to, to help. And when, when, when leaders embrace and understand that, uh, we're going to have a better world. We're going to have a much better world. We're going to have better organizations. We're going to have greater leadership. We're going to have better better nations, uh, and so on and so forth. That's that's what I mean by that mindset. Mindset mindset predicts emotions, predicts behaviors, predicts results. Beautiful, uh, John. Your recent book, wherein you cover the seven uh, core uh, things, unlocking the secrets. So, John, um, in each of them. Uh, is it because I remember somewhere in our conversation you did said like based on your coaching experiences with with various legendaries right and especially think big and uh, think big and differently you said very well with Steve Jobs so yeah. just I I know we are on a short on time but just a brief a snippet for the audience so that you know they could go and then look out for that which one you think out of those seven is going to be is very contextual. Uh, right now and uh, in the situation well uh, they're all, they're all critical no there's there's no question think differently think big being vulnerable being aware of your gifts and strengths leveraging those gifts and strengths being courageous being vigilant course correction the one that we just talked about Bouja, the uh, the mindset of duty right now in my personal opinion, is for all of us paramount, paramount for all of us being the leaders that we need to be in our families because our children mm -hmm. are looking to us for strength. And the strength that they're looking for is only going to come from the leaders of the family. And it's the same thing in our organizations. It's not about us. It's about others. And if we can help them arrive at a point of more certainty and more security, um, that's what we're called to do right now, more than anything else, I believe. Mm, it's all the mindset and thing. Beautiful. I'm going to um, take two more questions and then I'm going to leave it open for audience. Uh, John, coaching has historically, it was earlier viewed as intervention to fix problems right earlier but now the coaching has been evolved and uh, so what is the current uh, how has it been evolved and how do you see coaching evolving further and second is most of the times organizations sometimes they are really perplexed that who is the right candidate for coaching so some insights there john Okay, I would say um, th there's amazing trends going on in the world of executive coaching. One of the trends, obviously, is, is that um, we can get a lot done um, virtually, Pooja. Um, it, 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 we're, we're, that's going to continue to happen. You know, virtual coaching, you can accomplish a great deal, and you can actually do team coaching very, very well online. So I think that's going to continue. I don't think that's going to stop. And I think that's a very, very good thing. I believe that executive coaches who are going to do well 
uh, in, in the coming years are going to be coaches who can prove that they deliver results, right? The organizations listening in, they want to make sure if they're paying money, they're going to get a return. Most executive coaches fail miserably in that arena. Um, and I think that's really important is to be able to show that the work that you're doing has moved the needle in terms of results. Uh, I think that's going to be a growing trend for sure. Um, I think um, in terms of, um, you know, who can benefit from executive, I think we can all benefit from executive coaching. But for the organizations out there, you've got to sort of draw the line because executive coaching, as compared to other options, can be a little bit more expensive. So you need to, you need to look at the budgeting. You need to look at, um, you know, the degree of executive coaching that you want to do. I would say that executive coaching is ideal for uh, all leaders, all leaders, middle managers, directors, vice presidents, senior level, uh, fewer than 20% of CEOs in the world have ever worked with a coach. That, that is absolutely terrible. And we wonder why we got issues, right? Every CEO in the world should have an executive coach. Every CEO in the world, every athlete in the world's got a coach, right? If you're a professional athlete, you're surrounded by multiple coaches. So, um, you know, but I think once you get into high potentials in the emerging leaders, you can yeah. do accelerated executive coaching, accelerated, right? You may not have a nine or 12 month coaching journey, but you can ignite self-discovery through assessments and development planning and so on and so forth. I hope that helps. Absolutely, because you know, most of the time when you go in for coaching as well, and even organizations are public that do we really, because it's an investment. So do we really need to invest in someone who's going to come like let's say four to five years later, or should right. we invest once he's in that position? So I feel right. if you have invested in before, that he's coming in more prepared and uh, it's going to create a better culture and a uh, right leadership, isn't it? No question, no question about it. I agree with you 100%. Uh, Mike, one of the closing um, question is, uh, John, the coaching has evolved. And so are you coming up with various um, product lines so that, uh, so that people can, can connect and it, the coach, uh, you know, the rich resources can be more accessible to them. So would you like to just briefly share about your uh, various initiatives which you have coming up? Yes. Uh, so some of the exciting things that we've got going on is uh, we're, we're very, very excited about the launch of our franchise. We're franchising, uh, we're literally launching uh, what's called the Intelligent Leadership Executive Coaching Franchise in the United States, in Canada to start. 2021, we're gonna roll it out globally. Uh, we've uh, uh, already gotten a few franchisees on board. We're gonna start training them in about a week. Very humbled by this, Pooja, you know, because uh, the intelligent leadership executive coaching is, it's a philosophy that's very powerful that's needed in the world today, you know, and the process that's so results oriented is also needed. So we're excited about this. Um, the other thing that we've got going on is the launch of our academy, the intelligent leadership online academy. It's an online program that uh, takes the seven secrets of intelligent leadership and uh, brings those principles to leaders so they can take action on those principles uh, and get feedback from an online coach. And they're able to actually become an, a certified intelligent leader within 20 weeks, only spending 20 minutes on the platform per week. So we're really, really excited about that. That's going to be launching in a couple of weeks. So that's what we've got going on. Beautiful. And uh, so what Sumit has started, uh, I mentioned earlier that why do you call your work as an intelligent leadership? I know we have had a discussion that we better be an intelligent <laughs> leader than being a non-intelligent leader that's more apt. <laughs> So Sumit, that's why he calls it as an intelligent, because it's better to be an intelligent leader rather than not being an intelligent leader. <laughs> <laughs> and you are Absolutely. an intelligent leader once you have ignited and got 
inner and uh, inner core to outer core because that requires a lot of vulnerability. Yeah, I answered for you. You did it. You did it. You did it, Pooja. <laughs> you can add on. I was so excited about no, it. Right. Yeah, right. I know we have been talking about it, and I was like, okay, <laughs> let me answer this. Uh, so, John, now uh, before I hand it over to Sumit, and thank you so much, John, uh, for answering. Uh, it's uh, all the questions, and uh, it has been always an honor, always an honor and privilege honor. To, to hear and to listen from you. If I need to ask you a quick rapid fire, one rapid fire, that what are the top three uh, things which are non-negotiable for a leader, what they are? Three things which a leader just can't uh, negotiate with. And on this, then I will hand it over to Sumit. <laughs> I believe to be a great leader, you've got to non-negotiable look inside. You've got to have the courage to look inside. And lo and behold, discover two things, gifts and strengths. And yes, it doesn't matter who you are. I've worked with 65-year-old CEOs. And that when, when they all, when we, when we get them to look inside, Pooja, they discover, I can't believe that these gifts and strengths have been hiding deep within my soul. I don't think you can become a great leader unless you look inside, you discover your gifts and strengths, as well as your weaknesses, and you address them with courage. I think that's non-negotiable going forward. I believe number two, you've got to be the real deal. The world needs authenticity. Authenticity comes from the soul. If you're going to be a great leader, and all of us have the potential to be great leaders, you've got to be real, authentic, be honest. And I think the third is the vulnerability aspect. If you go forward in this very complex life thinking that you've got all the answers, you are sadly mistaken. You are not going to achieve all that you can achieve. You're not going to become all that you're called to be. Vulnerability is an igniter to growth. And for the organizations listening in, you're going to discover that vulnerability on your senior executive team is also the igniter to innovation. You do not have innovation in a business if you do not have vulnerability in your executives. There you go. Beautiful. I loved it. Over to you, Sumit. Thank you so much, John. Pooja, amazing. Thank you so much. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. I think uh, John, as your coach, is, is definitely proud today to see you the way <laughs> you the questions you really ask to take the best out of coming the best out of John here. I was on a hot seat today. Asking questions to your guru is like you yourself are on a hot seat. <laughs> uh, so, John, uh, while there has been quite a lot of questions being written here, but I found most of them being answered. Uh, while there are a few in which I would like to, if you could specifically deal with, there are a few uh, people who are coming up with uh, saying that uh, how, what are the early signs which you identify that a person is coachable or if a person you find is not coachable at all, how do you then deal with them, motivate, etc.? Three, four questions around it. Well, the first thing I do, Summit, is to make sure that they're open to getting feedback from stakeholders. I think that's really, really important. And if I sense any hesitancy, in a leader that they're not open to doing a 360 degree survey, they're not open to me reaching out to a select number of stakeholders. I will work with them to try to get them to see that there is massive benefit in making that decision. If they continue to roadblock me is when I, I make the decision not to work with them. Now in an organization, I'm gonna tell you, if you've got a leader and your leader is not open to uh, perspective from others, you've got a bad leader. You should find a way to get that leader out of there because absolutely, not only are they gonna be holding themselves back, they're gonna be holding back their teams. 
Okay. Uh, there is a specific thing which Nilesh has asked. What are the sources of agility and how to ensure agility or strategic agility? Well, when you look at agility as a behavior, right, it's, it's the evidence of flexibility, adaptability. Those are behaviors. And it's all ignited from within. And when you look at the inner core, there's a lot of predictors that will drive adaptability and agility. One is a balanced self-image. Uh, somebody who is arrogant or they don't believe in themselves, that's not, a, that's, not a, that's not the kind of balance that you're looking for. I think the other thing, too, is strong character, people who emphasize values of altruism, that's a predictor. People who are positive thinkers, that's a predictor. So those are the elements that you're looking for, in my mind, that will predict the behavior of agility. I hope that helps. Yes, Sumit. Sumit is frozen, is it? Your answer got him on thinking, John. <laughs> Sumit, are you there? He's speechless. He's speechless. He's speechless. He loved your answer so much, John, that he, he actually went on Sumit is back. <laughs> You, 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 you were speechless. You, were, you, you loved that answer so much you couldn't say anything. Yeah, and that's what happens in the live session in the audience. And that's what <laughs> Sumit showed it. <laughs> Sumit, you need to unmute, unmute, unmute. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Sumit. John, you set him thinking. <laughs> now you need to get him on the privileged mindset. <laughs> Uh, uh, while, while you are finishing that question, I was getting into another question which was speaking about your views about spiritual leaders. I think that spiritually made me suddenly go away. <laughs> Maybe. So it's, it's more so from uh, uh, one second, Arvind, who, who wants to ask what is spiritual leaders and uh, what are the characteristics of spiritual leadership? I would say that what we've been talking about today, uh, you can probably tell, otherwise the question wouldn't have been asked, I believe, is that there's a strong spiritual element that makes up the element of intelligent leadership. Uh, I'm sure everybody heard me use the word soul quite a bit. Uh, I use the word soul interchangeably with inner core and all the elements that hide very, very deep within. So whoever asked that question, you've put your finger on the pulse of what is absolutely vital uh, in the world today, which is the spirituality, the element that the inner core does, drives, does drive the outer core. And ultimately, if your spirit is strong, what, it, what are the elements? Well, to me, uh, the element of altruism is, is, a, is a critical element of, uh, of, of being a servant leader, too. I, I think when you think about spiritual leadership, you're thinking about servant leadership as well. And that's all ignited from a very, very strong and active helper trait. I believe that uh, collaboration is an element of servant leadership. And I think there's an element also of being other oriented, uh, Suman. I think, you know, it's not about you. It's being, uh, it's being proud to, to be part of something bigger than yourself. All of those elements ignited, whatever word that you want to use, uh, all of that's got to be in play for us to be really effective. It's an excellent question. And John, do you think in the spiritual leader, it would be even what we speak about the connectedness right? That a must level would be high and they would have a high privilege mindset as well. Uh, and it's higher order. I, I believe, yeah, absolutely. It's a higher order thinking. Uh, it, it is absolutely getting very, very, very uh, deep, very deep with uh, your core purpose, uh, understanding your destiny, 
Uh, and most people simply don't go there uh, and, and don't get there unless they're working with a coach who can get them there. And, and ultimately, you know, it's about abundance. You know, it's not about uh, financial abundance. It's about, like we were talking about earlier, Pooja, ultimately the question is at the end of the day, right, when you put your head on the pillow, is did, did you actually touch the hearts and the minds and souls of people that you came into contact with? And, and, and if you did in a positive way, yeah. that's a great day. Then when you wake up tomorrow, you do the same thing. And, and the more you do it, the better world that we're going to have. It, it's, a, it's a function of calibration, too. You know, you, we got we got to calibrate. And you can do it through prayer. You can do it through meditation. You can just do it through thinking, you know, just taking time to think, right? That's, that's all spiritual. Okay, great. Uh, this is the last one. Uh, three, four of them has asked about uh, the present pandemic situation. And uh, do you really think there is an ethical dilemma which is going within, within uh, the leadership here? And how do the leaders, might be some bullet points from you, that how would you then, we would then deal with it as leaders, if you feel so, any ethical dilemma? Well, I, I, believe, I, 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 I believe that, first of all, uh, we're, we're tested. We're being tested as a world. I believe the pandemic is a test. Uh, it's, it's without question causing us to pause. We, we, it, 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 we're, we're pausing. Uh, it is a time for calibration. It's very interesting. Some industries, right, are being impacted negatively. There are other industries, though, that are exploding right now. You know, med tech industry, pharma industry, um, you know, look at, look at anything e, any, any e-commerce, e-learning, right? exploding. So this is an opportunity for all of us to create a new path, a new destiny. Um, some organizations aren't going to make it. Others are, are going are to spawn up, are going to grow. I, um, I believe that um, a premium is going to be placed on some of the things that we talked about today. Care, concern, compassion, collaboration, communication. If you don't push the lever on those things, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to keep the glue together on your teams. You got to you got to be over communicating. You got to be over collaborating. You got to show your heart. All of those things. In the end, uh, yes, we're going to get a vaccine, but until then, the strength of the soul, individually and collectively. Uh, is is the greatest antidote to overcoming the pandemic in my mind. Good. Thank you. Great, great, John. It's really wonderful. Actually, when uh, Pooja was interacting with you, the last bit of it, uh, when you said about authentic leadership, I remembered about, it was quite a long time back when I was getting inducted into the ER leadership team of Unilever. My boss yes. handed over to me the authentic leadership that book and yes. said, this should be the Bible for being in this leadership team. So <laughs> wonderful to again, listen from you and uh, really you. great uh, learnings. And uh, I, I would now hand over to Rao Saheb Kangane. And then before we end the session, last words from you, John, we would like to hear from you. So now to uh, Kangane sir. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. John and Pooja having for this, you know, wonderful session. It was a really wonderful session, you know. I thank all the participants to be part of this session, you know. So, Sumitji, over to you. Uh, John, last few words. We are all already, we have shot over time by quite a, quite a few minutes. Well, thank you all so, so much for the uh, privilege to be with, uh, with all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, what a great honor. Uh, my, my last message is uh, one, of, one of hope. Uh, as we look at the younger people in the world, um, I'm excited about our future. I'm not worried about our future. I, uh, as I've traveled the world uh, the last few years, 
What's hit me more than anything else are the incredible young people who are so talented all over the world. And that gives me a lot of confidence as we go forward. You know, you look at the Generation Y, incredible talent, and now the Generation Z. I think all of us should look at these incredible young people and feel very hopeful that the world's going to be uh, in really good hands going forward. I, I, don't think, I don't think we go forward with fear. There's always going to be pandemics. There's always going to be disruption. But I look at the young people and I get very, very excited. And guess what? The pandemic is actually going to teach the younger people agility, right? Because now the younger people are wearing masks, you know? Three, four-year-old kids are wearing masks. I never had to do that right? And they're going to have to go to school with masks on, and they're going to have to do online learning and all of this. The younger people are going to be more equipped to navigate life than us. We should go forward with a lot of confidence and hope. And that's my last word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John, Pooja. Be safe and be healthy. Uh, that's to everybody in, in this call. Thanks once again. Thank you Thank all you. so much. Thank, Thank you, you John. Bye. Thank you, HRFI. Thank exactly. you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. I'm just replying to everyone. Just a quick one. Thank you, everyone. And Thank you, Rosep. Bye. 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 Thank you. See you. Pleasure. Bye. Sumiji is left. Sumiji. I think it's left. Hmm. <laughs> 